So um, today we start uh, with our uh, first seminar uh, for the Autonomous and Robotics Research Center seminar series, uh, which is dedicated to cutting edge technologies for underwater communication. Uh, it's uh, a big honor to have uh, as a first speaker, Professor John Potter. Um, and he will talk about uh, some crystal ball gazing into the future of underwater communications. I would like to give uh, some details of the bio of uh, Professor John Potter. So currently he's full professor at the Department of Electronic Systems in the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And he's also strategic communications director for the Center of Geophysical Forecasting. Professor Potter is a marine scientist with degrees in mathematics, physics, polar oceanography and glaciology from Bristol and Cambridge universities in UK. He's also an IEEE and MTS Fellow, an International Fellow of the Explorer Club. He has extensive senior management and technology development experience and the holistic big picture vision with a focus on environmental conservation and sustainability. His specialization includes underwater acoustic, inter Internet of Underwater Things, polar oceanography, ambient noise and marine mammals. Is the founder of the Acoustic Research Laboratory in the National University of Singapore and received the numerous international awards for his marine research and technology projects and is a IEEE Ocean Engineering Society Distinguished Lecturer. So thank you again, Professor Potter, and um, you can start uh, with uh, your uh, seminar, some crystal ball gazing into the future of underwater communications. Fantastic. Julia, um, an embarrassing uh, introduction, as all of these things normally are when somebody reads out your bio. Uh, it's <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for a very generous introduction. And uh, really, the, uh, the idea I have for, for the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes is just to throw some stuff out there uh, for people to think about and to stir some creative thought around. Um, and uh, maybe some of these things will be a little controversial, and that's good because that gets people's blood up and gets them to engage. So um, if you like uh, to keep your questions uh, either to a comment in the chat box so that we have a record of them and I can deal with them uh, in turn, and if you have a particular slide that you want to refer to where something went up that you want to point out uh, or mention, uh, the slide numbers should be shown uh, in the bottom left, and so you can remember which slide you, can, you want me to point to. So now the first technical challenge, of course, is to uh, share my screen, or at least share my um, uh, PowerPoint presentation. So let me see whether I can start by getting that right. Um, Exactly. So for all the people attending the seminar, there is uh, this uh, question and answer uh, panel where uh, you can write your question and at the end we will go through and uh, we will uh, ask uh, Professor to reply. So the first question is, do you see a pod of dolphins? Yeah, yeah, we see very well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. That means it works. And now you should also see a little red laser pointer, uh, which is my mouse so that I can point to things. Excellent. Okay, so let's get going. Um, the title of this is uh, Crystal Ball Gazing uh, into the Future of Underwater Communications. And uh, people who have attempted to uh, predict the future have been notoriously poor at doing so. And so I'm in very good company um, if I get some of this wrong. But I would like to start with an observation which I find uh, quite powerful. Um, and that is that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Um, that's the only way that you actually have any real control. You can't change the past, um, but you can change the future by what you do in the present. And my next uh, question is, uh, who said this? Um, it's a relatively famous statement. Uh, best way to predict the future is to invent it. And if you Google this, you will find uh, a lot of Google resources will tell you that it was, uh, it's a quote from Abraham Lincoln. And uh, I'd like to straighten that out, it's not. It's somebody called Alan Kay, uh, who was influential in uh, early computing. Um, and uh, this is one of his um, very nice quotations that I, I like to try and remember sometimes. 
And so uh, the uh, moral of this story is that uh, you shouldn't believe everything you read on the internet uh, just because there's a picture with a quote next to it by Abraham Lincoln. All right, so what is communication? Uh, I figured I should start by defining this um, because otherwise uh, how can we talk about the future of something we haven't agreed on? And uh, essentially communication involves there being some kind of source um, which has information that it wants to transmit. Uh, normally that's encoded in some way. Uh, it could be language. I'm currently encoding it using acoustics in a language called English. Uh, then I transmit this. Uh, at the moment, the transmission is uh, hybrid. It's partly um, physical vocal cords and partly uh, electrons. Um, there's a signal generated which goes through some channel. And the moment, uh, the channel is the internet where uh, there will be some noise injected inevitably. And then that signal noise is received and decoded and hopefully reaches its target. The bottom line for me, um, what I find most useful uh, as a way to define communication uh, is that it's simply the transfer of information. Uh, if I can get the information from the source around this loop to the target, then I have effectively communicated uh, from the source to, to the target. And this definition goes back to Shannon and Weaver and uh, 1949, so it has a good pedigree, and you can't go far wrong uh, following Claude Shannon. But I think uh, one of the interesting things about this definition is that it puts, uh, for example, um, sonar and radar as uh, types of communication. They are uh, essentially self-reflexive uh, communications where the information is not the signal you send out, but the fingerprint of the environment and the channel uh, on what you receive. So for things like sonar and radar, you put the source and the target together or not. They may be bi-static, multi-static. And you can think of these uh, sensing technologies as being communication technologies. OK, so enough about the pedantics. Um, Communication doesn't even have to be intentional. Um, for example, um, the way that uh, birds flock or fish swarm uh, is thought to be through essentially unintentional information transfer because other fish or other birds could see their conspecifics around them. They can react and change what they do in response to that. Well, that's been a transfer of information and it allows coordination. And uh, it doesn't have to be visual. If I'm in the water, for example, and uh, I'm extremely scared of sharks, then I might uh, emit some pheromones which would unintentionally communicate the message that I'm scared of sharks, uh, perhaps to an unintended uh, receiver. Mm, let me move my... Yes, uh, like this guy, for example. And so I could accidentally communicate to him uh, that I was scared of sharks, and I'm sure he would be more than happy to show up and uh, increase my fear. So what are some possible communication channels underwater? Um, I'd like to start by thinking large, um, obviously acoustic. Um, if you know anything about underwater communications, 99% of them are conducted acoustically, at least from, uh, from man-made systems. And most marine animals um, have a strong acoustic uh, sensing and communication capability. There's also, of course, optics. Uh, you can see underwater. Uh, that seems to work quite well in the first uh, 20 or 30 meters, perhaps, of, of the water column, where there's enough uh, light. And below that, if you create your own light, uh, you can still see things um, several tens of kilometers away. There's also olfactory, like our good friend, the shark that we saw in the previous slide. And this is essentially molecular communication, which is something which is uh, starting to attract attention uh, in some of the 6G thinking, um, which is worth, uh, worth going into a little bit uh, if you have the time. There is, of course, haptic. Uh, anybody out there who's a diver uh, who has been diving in extremely turbid waters uh, will know that um, you can't see very far, and very often tapping your buddy on the shoulder is the best way to get their attention. 
moving away from uh, the senses that uh, humans are familiar with, uh, we also have radio, uh, which works much better in space and air, but it's not entirely useless underwater. And along with that comes uh, magnetic transmission. And uh, the question I'm asking is, which of these might be uh, most useful underwater? How do we choose between them? Um, and which ones might we uh, consider to develop, not only now, but into the future? So we need to look a little bit. Um, acoustic is uh, one of the obvious answers. But what about um, optic and uh, RF, which, of course, all part of the electromagnetic spectrum? OK, here it is, electromagnetic spectrum. This is familiar to anybody who's done physics in high school. And on the left, we have um, very high frequencies and uh, very short wavelengths. Um, on the right, we have very long wavelengths, very low frequencies. This is uh, long radio waves. Um, FM is typically in here. Amplitude modulation is typically done down here. Uh, then you get microwaves and infrared. And then you get this very narrow band here, which I've expanded out uh, to show the visible spectrum. Uh, UV and so on. OK, so uh, we know that we can uh, see some of these uh, frequencies underwater. Um, and we use optics um, to detect things underwater and communicate. Why don't we use any of these other uh, frequency ranges? Because, of course, our eyes are limited to the visible spectrum by definition. But we have instruments that we could build which would work at all these other kinds of frequencies. Uh, why would we not take advantage and use those? Well, it turns out that you can use some of them. Um, the surprising one is this RF underwater range, which is at very low frequencies. And that brings all kinds of troubles, which I'll touch upon uh, in a following slide. Um, and of course, we do use the, the visible spectrum. But those are really it. We don't use anything else in between. And why do we not use anything else in between? Well, because of absorption. The electromagnetic uh, spectrum has an absorption rate, which looks like this. And guess what? The visible band is in here. And uh, that has very low absorption. And the absorption curve is quite complex. But it has very high absorption um, at higher frequencies and still extremely high absorption um, at uh, lower frequencies. And you have to go a long way off here to the side before that absorption rate drops to the point where it's usable, which is why the only RF we use um, is the very low frequency radio. And it has been used. There's something called uh, extremely low frequency undersea communications. And uh, if you're not familiar with this, it's kind of, uh, kind of funny. Uh, people don't think of radio communications as being uh, feasible in the order of hundreds of hertz. But ELF used hundreds of hertz. It therefore had a bandwidth of oh, a few bits per second. And um, the wavelength was about 1,000 kilometers. So you have to use the whole planet as an antenna. Um, the power is about a megawatt. So you're going to need a small power station just to power your radio. Um, the efficiency is about 10 to the minus 6. So the reception, um, although it penetrates well into the water, um, is still only about the order of a watt. And here is a facility. This is a transmitter um, of uh, ELF. It was used for American submarines. Uh, this is a 1982 aerial view of uh, the Navy Clam Lake, Wisconsin facility. And it did have its own dedicated uh, power station to power it. But clearly, uh, finding a order of um, a megawatt in order to get a few bits per second is not something that's going to appeal to most people. So this is an extremely expensive and slow way to communicate. And I do not think it plays a big part in future communications underwater. Acoustics, on the other hand, has enormous reach underwater, a great range. Uh, there was an acoustic transmission test in 1991. Um, it used a 57 hertz uh, pseudo-random pulse sequence so that you could get a lot of energy in the water spread out over, I think it was something like a 20 minute transmission and do pulse compression. Um, these are the sources. 57 hertz has quite a big uh, wavelength, so they're rather large, heavy uh, sources that were deployed. And uh, here's a map of um, 
where the source was placed, which is here, at a place called Heard Island, pun intended, and uh, the eigenpaths for the acoustic rays. And you can see eigenpaths running up here to the east coast of the US, and you can see eigenpaths running up to the west coast of the US. Uh, most of them are blocked, actually, by the New Zealand Tonga uh, chromatic ridge plate and so on here. Um, but there is a pathway through here, and there's a pathway through here. And this means that this signal could and indeed was received on both coasts of the US. So acoustics at the appropriate frequency transmitted into the deep sound channel will travel indeed a very, very long way. Why is underwater acoustics important? Well, because uh, this. This is an unusual uh, view of our planet. Uh, most maps and views of the planet are focused on the land, and I use this to remind ourselves that there is an awful lot of sea out there. 70% of the globe is covered with it. Uh, this map is uh, centered basically on the, the small Pacific islands in here. Uh, Hawaii chain is up here. Uh, there are some very small islands in here. Uh, New Zealand appears as the only prominent large landmass on this picture which pleases people from New Zealand because so many Mercator projection maps actually miss New Zealand out altogether and show everybody else's land mass, but not New Zealand. And this is uh, the converse. It shows New Zealand rather prominently and almost nobody else's land map. And despite the fact that this is obviously and patently a water planet for some bizarre reason, we've called it Earth, which just goes to show how twisted our thinking and point of view is. OK, so why is underwater communication so challenging? Uh, here's a bit of a recap. Um, RF and uh, magnetics and opticals have very limited range. They, uh, they take you out to the order of uh, tens of meters. Acoustic is the natural way to go because uh, at the right frequency, you can hear that all over the globe. And uh, so you'd think that would be a great solution. However, it has its issues. Um, absorption increases with frequency, which means we have to limit ourselves to perhaps no more than a megahertz. Uh, a megahertz will only get you probably a few meters before you start getting serious absorption. So actually, at that frequency, you're better off with optical or RF. And uh, if you go much lower into kilohertz, for example, obviously, that's going to hit your bandwidth, and you're going to get very little um, bits per second through the channel. The acoustic propagation speed is about five orders of magnitude slower than radio, and this is a complete nightmare. Uh, it means uh, that you get a lot of latency, and uh, wavelengths are very long. This means you get a lot of diffraction and modal propagation, uh, things you don't normally have to worry about so much with RF, uh, with a highly variable transmission loss, um, <clears throat> and you get both uh, temporal and Doppler spreading um, in abundance with a complex and rather variable noise environment. Um, a multipath is common for most underwater channels. Um, Doppler, of course, has a big impact because your propagation speed is so low. And just to cap it off, the channel temporal coherence is often less than a packet length. So it's a pretty much a nightmare place to transmit uh, digital information, at least acoustically. So here's a summary of some of the things I've been talking about. Um, it's a rough cartoon. Along the bottom here is approximately the range you can expect to reach. And up the side is the bandwidth that you can expect to achieve. And uh, acoustics has the enormous advantage that it can get out to a very large range. Um, at shorter range, you can get tolerable bandwidths, but they're still pathetic compared with uh, 5G or even 2G. Um, Optical and electromagnetic will give you, um, uh, and magnetic will give you a lot higher bandwidth, but they will only take you out to a few tens of meters. And uh, so all of these methods have their pluses and minuses. And the answer for me is that uh, there is no silver bullet, and the future will be a hybrid combination of all of these kinds of things, not just plunking for acoustic or optical or electromagnetic or magnetic. OK, so we have some tough challenges. Uh, we've got some basic physics uh, that uh, complicate our communications channel, make it rather difficult. 
Um, interoperability is non-existent. There are no standards underwater. This is something that we can do something about. Uh, the physics may be immutable, but politics, money and psychology are mutable to some extent. And these are the three things that are really standing in the way of interoperability. Uh, for example, there is no single way uh, that people have adopted to simulate an underwater communications channel. This is ridiculous. Um, the internet and uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, these internet technologies and communication technologies in air have all been built upon standards and upon standard adopted ways to simulate channels so that you can cheaply simulate the performance of a particular protocol. Unless you can agree on channels, canonical channels, uh, then you can't compare like with like, and it becomes very difficult to decide what kinds of uh, encoding schemes and uh, protocols work best in any given situation. And you've got to do this in simulation because going to sea is expensive, uh, and doing it in a controlled way is even more expensive if you can do it at all. So here are some possible solutions that I'd like to throw out uh, for you to think about. Slide 14. Uh, let's kick off with software-defined intelligent adaptive modems. And I mean um, software-defined, so they are not uh, monolithic uh, in, in hardware. They're intelligent so that they can um, make sensible decisions on the fly without having to be externally controlled to do so. Adaptive so that they can change their protocols, even their physical modulation scheme, to meet demands. Those are starting to come in already. Um, we need an open architecture, distributed and modular networking. Uh, the only way we're going to make enough progress in a short enough time to catch up with uh, internet and uh, 5, 6G is to be open architecture and have everybody start working on pieces of the problem in a way where they all plug together. We're going to see hybrid electromagnetic, electro-optic, magnetic uh, induction, and acoustic physical layers. Our modems need to be agnostic to the physical um, means. And this is something which has not yet been necessary in, um, in air and space communications, but uh, 6G is starting to embrace that. We'll come to that a bit later. MIMO, and I think massive MIMO, by which I mean more than a thousand uh, input output units is going to start playing a role because it can buy you so much in terms of um, multiple access, in terms of um, beam forming, noise rejection, um, so many things that you can buy if you have MIMO. And that will be enabled by smart adaptive surfaces. So we're going to get away from using uh, acoustic piezoelectrics, um, which are expensive, clunky, um, and not terribly efficient. And we're going to start seeing some interesting uh, smart materials. I think we're going to have to move to uh, network-driven MAC transport and session layers. We're going to have to have much more intelligent, adaptive uh, protocol stacks. And this will lead to software-defined networking, uh, where actually the networking uh, protocols will be both distributed and uh, more or less at the edge, not centrally controlled. Um, that's really where we're going with uh, network function virtualization. This is something which, these are things which are coming out now from the uh, Internet of Things world, but which are urgently needed in the underwater world because of the low bandwidth and the intermittency and the latency. And we're going to have to look at energy harvesting, um, for example, by piezoelectric bimorphs, which I think are an interesting way to, to power low power electronics. We're getting to the point where uh, we've got low power electronics that really um, uh, is much more efficient than electronics we've used in the past. And if we are smart about using um, electro optics, for example, uh, which is energy efficient, then we can start to think to power these things by piezoelectric bimorphs. And the endurance of underwater robotics is one of the major limiting uh, factors in, uh, in applying robotics to autonomous underwater systems. So if we can get that endurance up by energy harvesting and reducing our energy consumption, uh, then I think we're in, in with a chance. And uh, to supplement that, we'll see subsea garages with uh, inductive chancing, charging and data dump. It makes a lot of sense uh, to have an inductive charger. And then whilst the uh, device is sitting on your charger, it's uh, close enough that you can dump at gigabit rates uh, through an optical connection. 
And I think we're going to start seeing some interesting developments in things like asymmetric communications links. For example, distributed acoustic sensing, where uh, you can um, receive acoustic uh, information through conventional fiber optic uh, cables. And there are 1.3 million kilometers of these cables already laid across the oceans. And if an AUV can go um, sit on one of those cables and transmit an acoustic signal, and you can pick it up, you may not be able to talk to the AUV, but the AUV can talk to you. So that's an asymmetric channel, which is uh, very energy efficient and uh, would open up the possibilities for robotics to report important information without having to go all the way to the surface. Okay, so let's get uh, a sense of perspective here. Um, this is what happened to the internet on land. I want to get a sense of the timescales here. The early internet was started up in uh, the 70s. That's, you know, within living memory, at least for some of us. Um, the first web page came up uh, in 91. Wi-Fi was about 10 years later. And um, by 2012, we already had 600 million websites and 2 billion email and internet users. So things take off exponentially. Um, we started talking about Internet of Things somewhere around 2014. Um, Internet of Underwater Things is now getting kicked off. And what I'm finding really interesting is that a lot of the things in the early 6G planning, now that we've got 5G more or less rolled out, um, are talking about software-defined modems, software-defined networking, virtualization of network functions. And these are all things which are going to be developed for in-air RF, but which are urgently needed in underwater comms. And I think that's where we're going to see a convergence. So for a sense of perspective, um, here is a map of the internet. This was probably the last time that the entire internet could be uh, written down on a single side of A4 paper legible to the unaided human eye. And this was in March 1997. Here is a picture which I use occasionally to remind myself of how fast technology can change. Uh, this is a product from the data processing division of IBM. And I think it's uh, 1956. And this was a five megabyte hard drive which these boys are uh, loading into the back of a truck. And then in uh, 2019, I see that on Amazon, you can buy a two terabyte USB drive for about $30, which I would hazard a guess was a lot cheaper than the IBM product in 1956. So new tech can be really fast and it tends to be exponential. Uh, here's a uh, a cartoon for the number of years it took or time it took for each product to gain 50 million users. And the products are arranged in uh, order of the shortness of time that it took to get 50 million users. But you will notice that they're also more or less arranged in the times uh, in the correct chronological order in which they were introduced. And so we go from uh, 60 odd 50 years for things like airplanes and telephones down to sort of 10 years for a cell phone, four years for things like iPods, YouTube, and um, social media, and 19 days for Pokemon Go. So things are not only changing, but they are accelerating. And as I've said, uh, the ability to construct something like an Internet of Underwater Things is going to be fundamentally predicated on standards. That's what uh, the case has been for in air, and uh, it will be the same for underwater. And we don't have any at the moment. And that is one of the principal blockages. So if you fancy yourself as being good at um, getting standards through, then uh, there's a lot of room for you in a career in this area. Um, in my view, they happen through three main mechanisms. Uh, top down coercion from big players, that's a push mechanism a bottom-up demand from user, that's a pull mechanism, and organized consensus, and uh, sometimes a combination of all three. But um, <clears throat> discussing these three and how they interact is uh, the subject of a completely independent discussion. So my view is that the future will have uh, nested, heterogeneous, intelligent autonomy underwater. Um, and I'll go into those details one by one. Um, here's a cartoon of um, 
a network which is connected from underwater through the surface to space. And I think this is where we're going next. And I'll come to a vision of 6G in a moment, which will reinforce this. Um, the underwater devices are going to be, unless they will have to communicate with each other and with gateways. Those gateways will almost certainly be uh, autonomous, generally autonomous surface platforms, but they may be crewed platforms such as uh, the ship that you see there. Um, and those uh, surface platforms may all independently talk to the satellites. Um, these uh, modems will be software defined, so they will be reconfigurable agnostically to different physical media, different protocols, according to the needs of the application and the environment. If things are close to each other, they might signal each other optically. If they're further apart, they might use acoustics. All of this needs to be bound together, and um, there will be a software defined networking um, protocol, which is a cohesive um, distributed network decision. And that's where the uh, virtualization of uh, network functions will be. And this is where the human in the loop will be, because the rest of it, I think, will be largely AI driven. Why? Well, there's a reason for this. Um, there is a, a kind of diagram, if you like, or a cartoon, uh, where you've got communication capacity on one axis, and you've got network or uh, intelligent autonomy on the other axis. And basically, if you've got a lot of communication capability with a lot of bandwidth, you can afford to have a pretty stupid network uh, because you've got the ability to control it remotely. It doesn't have to be smart. And you can go for a centralized operator control. If you have very low bandwidth, then you need to go for something that's very smart. Um, and that needs to be distributed because individual assets don't necessarily be able to talk to each other because the uh, communication channel is very intermittent. So each device then needs to be smart enough uh, to take smart decisions on its own. And this is why we're going to need a lot of AI in underwater networks. And the sensor performance goes up um, as you improve bandwidth and intelligence. But system performance goes up even more rapidly as you improve intelligence because your uh, devices are able to talk to each other and uh, coordinate. Here's a view of uh, a 6G vision. Uh, this comes from a fairly recent paper, 2019, published in IEEE Access, um, called A Survey on Green 6G Network Architecture and Technologies. And I find this uh, particular figure inspiring because for the first time, it includes the underwater network. Um, it's still a matter of great debate whether the underwater network can effectively be integrated into 6G or not. At the moment, we're still struggling with whether we can even make an undersea network in an ad hoc, reliable way. But you see that uh, they have um, RF, optical, and acoustic all listed here as being um, major physical mechanisms for the underwater, which I think is on the money, um, and that they want it fully integrated also with space. So we've got surface assets here talking to uh, satellite Earth stations and potentially also to uh, um, Earth, low Earth orbit satellites. And with things like Starlink going up with 4,400 odd um, satellites, um, I think the role of satellites in uh, the Internet of Things is going to become much stronger. It used to be a, a last resort if you didn't have GSM or some other kind of network, then you have to go to the satellite, and that would be much more expensive and would have latencies and so on. I think it's going to, in the future, satellites are going to be a lot cheaper, a lot more ubiquitous, and we're going to see it as the first resort rather than the last resort for a lot of networking uh, solutions. And I can see the undersea network will need to communicate directly to the space network. But there's more interesting things going on here. Uh, looking from the control view, uh, they're talking about distributed artificial intelligence. This is exactly what I just uh, made an argument for as being essential for underwater networks. In other words, this is something which the underwater communications people have already been thinking about for some time. And now we're starting to see it show up in the above water um, 6G thinking for the planet. Same with real-time intelligent edge. Um, we're going to see a lot of edge computing because we cannot transmit lots of data underwater because the bandwidths are so low. So we're going to see a lot of intelligent edge computing 
underwater. And this is, again, where underwater thinking is actually leading in air internet thinking. And I'd like to talk uh, more than uh, intelligent radio. I'd like to say intelligent radio, acoustic, and optic software-defined modems uh, are already in, uh, in production uh, in some facilities for underwater environments. And again, the underwater challenge is thinking, if anything, ahead of where uh, the in-air IoT thinking has been. And uh, from a network view, content-driven routing, uh, this uh, is one of the ways to get much more efficient routing, uh, much more efficient networks. And this is uh, very applicable where your channel um, bandwidth is, is constrained. So a lot of the 6G thinking plays right into where we have been looking underwater. And I think that makes uh, for a bright future for uh, linking 6G with underwater. So one of my visions is for an Earth Ocean Atmosphere Virtual Observatory, uh, which would be cloud-based, um, would have a lot of edge and fog computing components with multi-sensor fusion, automated processing at the edge, um, and big data mining in the cloud. Uh, and this hinges on distributed acoustic sensing as one of the major ways to uh, fuel this observatory with data. And the Internet of Underwater Things is an integral part of this kind of vision. And I think this is, uh, this is perhaps where one might hope the future goes. OK, so I'm going to start wrapping up. Uh, what does the future hold as uh, a kind of summary of some of the things I've talked about? Underwater, I think uh, clearly it's going to involve heterogeneous physical communication modes. Um, optic and acoustic are already being used, but so far not in the same modem. I think that will change. We're going to see multi-physical media modems. We're going to see software-defined modems that are much smarter uh, than just uh, software-defined radio um, and do a lot more than simply uh, pick up different waveforms. They're going to switch between different physical layers. They're also going to um, abstract the networking functions much higher up in the communication Uh, software-defined and information-centric uh, networking, um, which is something that's coming out of 6G, but which is immediately desired and applicable for underwater. Uh, certainly ad hoc uh, network protocols for the underwater um, internet, internet of Things. We're going to see uh, quantum communication for uh, security. Uh, this is something which is taking off now uh, across the board. And I think it will also play a role in underwater acoustics. We're going to see much more RF and magnetic communications modes and modems. Um, we're going to see distributed acoustic sensing via fiber optic cables coming into play as asymmetric uh, communications channels. MIMO systems, including um, beam diversity, multiple access, uh, that's a very powerful uh, set of technologies and signal processing, which has hardly been brought to bear as yet. And I think down the road, especially with uh, the advent of smart, programmable, nano and intelligent materials, my multi-MIMO, massive MIMO is going to become possible. And that's going to buy us a lot of additional channel capacity, as well as security. And uh, we're going to see real-time intelligence uh, edge computing by necessity, and essentially we already have that in our autonomous systems. Um, the, the autonomous systems that are running now underwater are uh, relying more and more on AI and uh, truly intelligent adaptive behavior. And that AI will be distributed because you cannot have long distance, reliable, centric communications underwater. It's essentially going to have to be modular and distributed. So distributed AI is going to form uh, a big part of that picture. OK, so uh, wrapping up, and I hope I'm uh, more or less within my 40 minutes that was planned. Uh, the question I uh, want to ask is, who gets to say what comes next? And uh, you should know the answer to that, because you do. And that's because the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. A very, uh, very interesting and clear uh, speech. Uh, okay, I see already, yes, some questions. So I start reading. 
So thank you, Professor Potter, for your inspiring presentation. I was wondering if an underwater communication network might destructively interfere with the biological ecosystem. Thanks. So certainly it can. And um, as I said, I regard sonar systems as communications, uh, acoustic communication systems, and sonars have certainly um, been proven to disruptively interfere with biological ecosystems. Uh, so this is something that we need to pay a lot of attention to. And uh, it's one reason why I'm very keen on low power and electro-optic uh, magnetic induction and so on uh, technologies because they are generally much less intrusive. I would like to get away from high power, lower frequency acoustics, um, not least of all because of this uh, intrusiveness onto biological ecosystems. And so I'm absolutely with you. Um, this is something that needs to be thought through very carefully. And we've already seen a lot of controversy in uh, the Internet of Things and uh, 4 or 5G uh, rollouts um, where people are very concerned about uh, the impact on birds and other uh, animals. Um, I think we will uh, see much of the same concern in the underwater domain. And it's right that we um, are conscious of that and, and plan carefully around that. Thank you so much. There is another question from Professor Akildiz. Uh, you mentioned that about the molecular communication could be used for underwater. Can you please elaborate? Yes. So, for example, um, if I'm fearful, um, then I excrete uh, certain um, pheromones which uh, animals sense. And dogs, of course, in air scent this immediately. They know when you're frightened of them. And um, sharks, I believe, underwater already do this. Uh, they will also show up in similar ways. Um, I know people who excrete different kinds of molecular um, signals where um, there are people who've spent a lot of time with sharks, for example. And when they go diving, uh, the sharks just show up to get belly rubs. Um, so we are already inadvertently using molecular communication. And there are some situations where um, Electro-optic or acoustics does not work particularly well. But if the water currents are in your favor, and particularly, for example, if you're signaling through a material being pumped through a pipe or something of that nature, uh, molecular communication is potentially a very low energy, very low cost way of encoding and communicating. And so I think there's, uh, there's interesting potential. And again, it's horses for courses. It's not going to work for everybody's needs all the time, but there are specific applications where I think that may be an interesting technology. Great, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> there is another point. So I'd like uh, to expand on the challenges on computational simulation side. What are the, battle, uh, the bottlenecks currently? So, uh, I think the biggest bottleneck right now is that people uh, do not have canonical channels. They do not have agreed simulation protocols. So uh, what happens is um, somebody comes up with some kind of protocol or technology. Um, they uh, design it, of course, as best that they can, given the constraints and their understanding of the physics. And then they write uh, some kind of simulation code uh, to test it. And inevitably, of course, um, the things that they don't know they don't know are inherent both in the design of the communications and in the design of the simulator. So surprise, surprise, um, their technology performs very nicely in their simulator and they report better results than anybody else has been able to get. And nobody knows whether to believe this or not, because, of course, their simulator is different from everybody else's simulator. There are as many simulation methods as there are protocols and uh, technologies to test. And so there's no like-for-like -like comparison. What we need is a set of agreed canonical channels and simulation technologies that everybody signs up for. So if, for example, you are in the optical um, data compression business, there is a particular photograph, which I believe was originally published in Vogue, which everybody knows. And it's a photograph of a woman in a hat. And every image compression algorithm ever invented since that started to become a de facto standard for testing it on 
they have to run their argument on that image because everybody knows what uh, the artifacts look like from different kinds of compression technologies. And that's become a standard image to compress so that you can see how well it does. We don't have anything like that for underwater comms. And that's one of the, uh, the major hurdles. So we've got tremendous computing power. We have tremendous memory. Um, the cost of memory is peanuts now. As I said, you can buy a two terabyte USB for $30. The cost of computing is comparatively peanuts. It's no longer uh, an issue to be able to cope with complex physics. We can do that at relatively low cost. Those are not the hurdles to um, computational simulation. The hurdles are primarily psychological, political. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I see some more questions. Uh, I'm trying to be fair. I give uh, for each person one question, and then maybe we will start again. So can we use phonons in underwater communication? Recently, it was proposed that we use entangled phonons in quantum communication, and the experiments uh, look promising. Entangled phonons? Yeah. OK. I think this is um, something that they need to teach me about. Um, so quantum entanglement, I think I understand a little bit. Uh, phonons, um, I'm not so sure, entangled phonons. But um, from what little it sounds like uh, it might be, then certainly that could be, uh, that could be an interesting underwater comms. So I'd be more than happy if they point me to a paper uh, that describes what they're talking about. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy for you to make my email address uh, available. Yeah. If you just type in NTNU and my name, which is uh, down in the corner here, um, then you'll find that the NTNU will give you my email address if you if you have no time to write it down. Yeah, yeah definitely. I will share now on the chat. Yeah, uh, I see another question. Thank you for your talk. How do you see the future competition and cooperation of the networks with the centralized control like STN and the, the non-coordinated networks like Manet or Mesh? So. I think underwater, most networks will be distributed. Um, there are some special cases where central control makes sense. And I think what will happen is that the, uh, the meshing will happen at the interface. So in order to connect underwater with the rest of the world, um, mostly it will have to go through a gateway. And since you have to squeeze everything through this point-like gateway, that's the natural place to uh, uh, be able to mesh centrally controlled networks with distributed networks. Okay, thank you so much. You have so many questions because uh, it was a very interesting topic. So another question that I see from um, Professor Akilditz, I think, do you foresee any significant improvements on higher data rates and how? Oh, yes, I think, uh, I think so. Well, obviously, if you're going to use um, RF electro-optics and so on over, over presumably limited ranges, you're going to see massive improvements in data rates. And that we already know. There are some underwater um, optical modems, for example, which are already giving us much higher data rates. Um, but even with things like acoustics, um, particularly using um, nano materials, smart materials, reconfigurable and reprogrammable materials, I can see it becoming cost effective to go for massive MIMO. And once you can do that, you can buy uh, an awful lot of uh, bandwidth and throughput for the, uh, for the channel by being able to run multiple um, transmit receive channels at once, for example, through beam directivity. Um, and effectively, you can multiply your, your data rate through the channel enormously through that kind of technology. So I think that's, that holds uh, considerable um, promise. Um, there are, of course, you know, fairly fundamental physical constraints about absorption and stuff, which limits acoustics and has done for half a century. Um, but MIMO is, is a way of doing an end runner around uh, some of those problems. Okay. And I think that would be powered by smart and uh, reconfigurable surfaces. I see. Thank you. Um, another question from Mohamed El Mbali. Uh, I would like to ask your opinion regarding the utilization of low frequency and medium frequency radio communication for short range communication. Uh, so this has been used. Um, as I say, there's a problem in that absorption is uh, too high for 
um, higher frequency radio waves. So you're kind of stuck. You've either got to go really low frequency, and then you need a lot of power, and you've got very low bandwidth, but you can penetrate hundreds of meters. Um, the French and some other countries used a, a kind of VHF level, I think it was uh, HF, VHF uh, frequency uh, domain where they would get uh, perhaps 10 meters into the, into the ocean uh, with a frequency range that was uh, much higher than the ultra low frequency. That means it takes a lot less power, you need smaller antennas, and uh, your submarines could understand your message and you get more bits per second, uh, but they had to be at periscope depth, which is or without having to raise their periscope. Um, so this is a big advantage. Submarines don't like coming to the surface. They do not like putting their periscope above the water. Um, there are some very good radars which will pick up periscopes from quite long distances away. And so being able to talk to your submarine without them having to get closer than 10, 20 meters of the surface is a big advantage. And so medium frequencies were used for that. Um, whether that's got a future or not, I don't know for sure, because now we've got LIDAR, which in clear water will get you down to 30, 40 meters. This overlaps the range at which medium frequencies uh, can be used, which means in principle you could image submarines, um, you could see them if they're only 20 meters deep, if they're in relatively clear water. Uh, and that reduces the um, security of using a mid-frequency uh, radio. And I'm not sure I see anybody else uh, wanting to use mid-frequency uh, because it's still fairly low bandwidth, still requires quite a lot of, of power and larger antennas. Um, and so uh, personally, I'm not seeing a, a big future in, in medium-frequency radio, but I'm more than happy to be proved wrong. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, is, there, um, is there any other question? Maybe no. But in any case, uh, Professor Potter is always available uh, to, for further discussions. And on the chat, uh, you can find uh, his email address. So essentially, you can copy for further communication. There was a question of why am I Andrew Chopra? <laughs> exactly. yeah. which I believe <laughs> the answer to that is because you used a personalized uh, Zoom link to join the chat and uh, it's encoded with that person's name. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think it's very interesting uh, all the application of AI in underwater uh, communication. I think it's a field uh, very much uh, interesting. Do you see, um, I mean, can you identify different lines of application of AI in underwater communication? I think AI is going to be used ubiquitously on, uh, on underwater robotics and not just for communication. And uh, it's going to need to be at the core of uh, software-defined networking and software-defined modems to take intelligent choices adaptively according to the application and the environment. And so there's going to be um, a big feedback loop so it's not only feed forward, like the traditional communication stack is a sort of a feed forward, there's no feedback. Um, and that's going to go. And uh, that's going to empower AI to make uh, smart choices on almost everything from the physical layer to the network, the upper networking layers uh, as to how that communication is going to, going to be done. And there's going to be a lot more interaction between the AI that's running the communications and the AI that's running the mission. They will need to talk to each other uh, and, and be hand in hand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, any other question from uh, the audience? Yeah. Say now or forever hold your peace. Exactly. Maybe no. I think we answer all the question. Yeah. So um, it has been a really very inspiring and very clear <laughs> presentation. I think a really good start for this seminar series. Uh, I would like uh, to thank you again for this uh, contribution. And thank you for inviting me. Exactly, and uh, I really hope that we can have uh, some further uh, interaction and collaborations. That would be very, very exciting. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's good to see you and to meet you, if only virtually. <laughs>
And uh, I hope uh, perhaps in the not too distant future, we'll bump into each other at a conference somewhere. Sure. Thank you. Have a nice evening. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to everybody showing up.